right, so uh, switch gears a little bit and we'll talk some about uh, biologics. So, you know, some of these UCL tears, specifically partial tears, can be treated non-surgically. You know, we've, we've done a, a fair bit of work uh, looking at that. We had a study 2016 and a, a follow-up study uh, uh, last year. Um, you know, quite simply, how do we do it? N nothing fancy here. We basically just rested them for four to eight weeks, PT, and then, and then started them on a throwing program. But it, it raises the question, you know, could our results have been better or potentially returned faster with uh, biologic uh, therapy? Uh, you know, why are these uh, appealing? Uh, biologic therapy can enhance healing or regeneration of, of tissue. Uh, by really changing the environment at the site of injury. Potentially, these can accelerate recovery. Uh, the problem is that indications uh, for use of these therapies is, is still somewhat ill-defined, and there's not a lot of great uh, evidence. Um, so, so what are we talking about? Um, re really kind of three things. One would be PRP or platelet-rich plasma. Uh, secondly, uh, stem cells, or, or oftentimes referred to as mesenchymal stromal cells. Uh, within that subgroup, you've, the, the two main uh, things used are, are bone marrow aspirate, which typically comes out of the uh, iliac crest of the pelvis. And then you can also get stem cells from subcutaneous fat, which typically comes from the abdomen. Um, the third product would be amniotic uh, products which actually do not contain any live cells and do not contain stem cells, but all these pop up problem problem in uh, medicine is when you get like cash pay products, you know, all these clinics pop up. And so there's all these quote stem cell clinics and many of these clinics were using these amniotic products, um, which don't actually contain stem cells. The thought is that the, the proteins there cause stem cell recruitment. Uh, those, uh, I believe the FDA pretty much Band. I, I think they're kind of, you have to go through a process to get, get uh, you know, approved, but those, those were essentially banned. Um, there, there's not, um, you, you know, the stem cells are really sexy because in theory, you know, you're putting these cells in and they can turn into what you need, whether it's ligament, tendon, bone, whatever, and you can get tissue recovery. But really in practice, that has yet to be proven. And there's like zero studies with stem cells and UCL injuries. Uh, again, we talked about embryonic products, no data on that. So, so my talk's really going to focus exclusively on PRP because we actually have, um, you know, some science uh, for that. So, okay, so you've got uh, blood. What's in blood? You've got red cells, white blood cells, and then plasma. The, the plasma is the, the non-cellular portion of the blood, and that's got platelets and uh, other growth factors. And so by definition, PRP is a sample of blood plasma that has greater than two times the amount of platelets over uh, baseline. Uh, here's a, a platelet, um, and they've, the platelets have these granules in them, the dense granules, alpha granules. And when the platelets are uh, activated, you, you get all these growth factors, TGF beta, platelet-derived growth factor, VEGF. So you get all these growth factors. And so that's uh, why the, the uh, PRP is appealing. So kind of PRP 101, you know, how, how do you get it? You, you have uh, whole blood. You spin that in a centrifuge, and then you, you basically have plasma, uh, the buffy coat, which has platelets and white blood cells, and then red blood cells. You toss out the red blood cells, um, and, and that leaves you with a, a product that you uh, can use. It's going to have not as many platelets, but it, it's also not going to have as many white blood cells. If you spin that again, you, you, you get this other product, which you get a higher concentration of, of PRP, and you're going to get a lot more um, platelets, but also more white cells. So the longer you spin it in the centrifuge, more platelets, but also more white cells, which is more inflammatory. Um, and that, it depends on kind of where you're putting the PRP. So if you're putting it in a joint, you don't really want inflammation. You're going to use that first product, whereas, you know, like for a UCL or for a tendon, typically you are going to want more uh, of an inflammatory response and, and more platelets. Um, one thing that makes it really hard to evaluate literature is there's, there's a lot of different ways to prepare PRP and a lot of different classification systems. So it's really hard to compare studies. So this is just like one classification system. And you can see there's like, you know, four, two, two, two in terms of 
where you can fall. So like using this classification system, there's like 32 different ways that you could, you could classify PRP, which again, makes it really hard with these, these studies. Uh, so, you know, how, how do we do this? You, you take blood, depending again, what system you're using and what kind of PRP you're trying to create 15 to 60, 60 cc's of blood, uh, centrifuge that to create the PRP, uh, and then inject it. Um, Again, depending on where you are, like if I was putting it at a knee, I personally wouldn't use ultrasound. If it's for UCL, I would have one of my partners, you know, inject it under ultrasound uh, guidance. So, so let's uh, now look at what evidence is out there. Uh, first study, 2013, uh, 34 athletes, partial UCLs, documented MRI, and they got a single injection of uh, leukocyte-rich uh, PRP under ultrasound. 88% return to play at about 12 weeks. And they also saw a decreased uh, medial joint space uh, opening. Uh, limitations, however, no control group. Almost all the tears were proximal. So it kind of raises a question of these results uh, generalizable to other uh, areas of uh, injury for the UCL. Uh, they do have some nice pictures. This is actually one of their distal tears, but you can see this. There's a pretreatment picture on the on the left, a, a partial distal tear of the UCL, and then a post-treatment uh, MRI, which honestly looks you know looks pretty good. Next study: Josh Giants, 2016, 44 baseball players. They use a a leukocyte poor uh, PRP. Partial tears, mix of proximal and distal, and then if, if patients still had symptoms after three weeks, they did a repeat injection. They did not um, uh, specify um, location of uh, tear. Their results weren't weren't nearly as good. Um, Seventy three percent return to play, but you look at return to same level of play it was only thirty four percent, so not not nearly as uh, as good. Uh, next study, uh, deal 2017, 25 athletes, partial tears, you know, diagnosed with MRI, acute injuries. And then they did two injections of leukocyte rich PRP two weeks apart. They also used a, an elbow brace, a varus producing elbow brace, repeated MRI six weeks post injection. They had like really good results. 96% returned to same level of play. Uh, it took about almost, uh, you know, three months and, and the post-treatment MRIs look really good. Uh, again, no control group, which is always a problem with these studies. All the injuries were acute, so may, you know maybe a lot of them would have healed anyway. And then this brace, uh, you know, maybe that was the the key there. Maybe it wasn't so much the PRP. Uh, next study, 2019, 34 baseball players, uh, partial or complete tears, uh, treated with the leukocyte poor ACP, but again, pretty good results. 26 out of 30 returned to pre-injury uh, level of play at 12 weeks. Decreased medial joint space uh, opening. Again, problem, no control group. And then uh, our last study, this is, this is a big one. This is from the MLB database and basically pulled uh, numbers for 544 pro baseball players treated non, non-operatively for UCL injuries. 133 received PRP. Now, the PRP group was older and more commonly uh, MLB as opposed to minor league. And they also performed a matched uh, one-to-one match comparison of the PRP to the no PRP group. Uh, MRI scans only available for 243 of these. So what did they find? Well, the no PRP group returned to throwing two weeks faster. Although r- really, if you look at it, most of these guys got PRP injections two weeks after they stopped throwing. So that, that probably accounts for why the, the no PRP group um, returned faster. But if you look at return to play, you know, no, no difference. 57% with no PRP, 46% with PRP. Maybe this is, uh, you know, biased because again, the PRP group was an older age and higher percentage of, of major league players. Also 20% of them were grade three, you know, complete tears, which I personally would argue probably isn't going to, isn't going to work. Match comparison analysis, again, no difference um, in uh, return to play. So, you know, limitations, there was a lot of variability in, in rehab program and, and type of PRP injected. You know, for example, it seems like most physicians allowed return to play or return to throwing rather in three weeks following PRP. Personally, I, I wait six weeks uh, after doing PRP injections. And again, only 45% of the cases had reviewable MRI scans, which makes for limitation. So putting this all together, what do we have? We've, we've got some small retrospective studies that show reasonable success treating partial uh, UCL injuries with PRP, a large study of pro baseball players, no difference, although again, some limitations there. So we have really no great evidence that either supports or uh, refutes uh, PRP. 
you know, wh what's my approach to this? Well, I, I think there's enough theoretical evidence as well as, you know, somewhat weak study evidence to, to support use, unlikely to cause harm. Obviously, there's an extra cost here with the pro players. It's, you know, the team pays for it. But if you, your regular patients, you know, it's $1,000. Um, I will offer it to players where I, where I think it's uh, appropriate. Uh, I, I don't think it's likely to work for a complete tear, so I wouldn't uh, necessarily use it on them unless the athlete simply doesn't want surgery. Uh, I do think it's it's worth considering um, for adding a treatment of a partial tear, maybe augments healing. And the other thing it does, you know, it hurts and it, it and it slows them down because a, a lot of times these guys, if you're trying to treat them without surgery, they want to start throwing in two or three weeks. And you give them the PRP and it kind of shuts them down for six weeks. Who's the ideal patient? I, I think obviously partial tear, younger players with healthier ligaments, and then also proximal uh, tears. Uh, we use a leukocyte rich, uh, PRP preparation. Uh, one of my partners is good with ultrasound. I have him do these. He uses kind of a peppering technique where he, uh, you know, puts a PRP along the course of the, uh, ligament. Uh, we'll get them in PT early for mainly working on their shoulder and then see them back in six weeks. If they're not tender at that point and have a negative moving valgus stress test, then we'll start a, uh, throwing program at this, at that point. You know, in, ter in terms of my experience, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I don't have any um, anything scientific. We've not really tracked them. I, I think we've generally had good results, uh, although, you know, again, typically I've reserved this for, for treatment of younger athletes. I think it's reasonable to offer to people, but I think you also need to have an honest discussion about what the uh, what the science shows. So thanks very much.